Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching the ins and outs of VLANs. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at VLANs. So we'll, first, we'll start off with simply what exactly are VLANs, kind of give you an overview. Being a vSphere administrator, you're probably at least vaguely familiar with VLANs, probably use them. I uh, still find environments where they don't do that. So we'll start with a quick introduction of what exactly are VLANs. Then I'll give you some VLAN recommendations. We'll talk about who handles the actual tagging of frames for VLANs, any gotchas when you're using VLANs. We'll dive into private VLANs, which are something that I think are underutilized in most environments. And finally, some vSwitch security settings. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So what exactly are VLANs? Well, VLANs, or virtual local area networks, allow you to have many virtual networks running over a single physical network. Simply put, I can have a switch or a group of switches and I can carve those up into multiple virtual networks. Just like we take a physical server and have it run virtual machines on top of it, we take this physical network and have it run a bunch of different networks inside of it. This way I can have a set of switches and have one network and range of IP addresses for say NFS traffic or iSCSI traffic or servers or maybe different types of servers and I can keep those separate you know on separate networks so it is very much like a separate network running on one physical topology so each different VLAN has different IP addressing each different VLAN is a different what we call broadcast domain meaning when a host broadcasts on that VLAN only other things on the VLAN see it even if a switch is set up to have 10 different VLANs running across it, you know, only devices that are on that VLAN where the broadcast occurred will see it. So we call it, it's segmenting the broadcast domain. And the idea here is it allows us to kind of logically subdivide the network and do many different things. Now, if a switch, you know, you take a 48 port switch and it can do X amount of throughput across that switch across the back plane, just because I have two VLANs running on it doesn't mean that each VLAN gets full potential of the switch. You're still limited by, you know, switching throughputs and things like that of the switches, so keep that in mind. I mean, creating a new VLAN doesn't magically give you more performance, and that's something odd that I see on occasion where people will kind of create a VLAN for, say, storage traffic, you know, thinking, well, it's going to protect that traffic from other things, you know, and keep it from being, you know, performance being impeded. Well, that's not really true. I and mean, you could do some sort of quality of service and things like that on switches, but normally all VLANs are treated as equal, traffic across them is equal. So just because you put in a VLAN specifically for iSCSI doesn't give that any more precedence than anything else. It just allows you to segment that traffic, reduces the chance of misconfiguration, kind of helps with security somewhat, and, you know, just kind of makes it easier to manage. Security is a good thing to talk about real quick. I also see people say, well, we segment traffic VLANs for security. If I have an Ethernet cable plugged into a switch and the other end is plugged into, say, my vSphere server, and I've got 10 VLANs running across that cable, uh, you know, anybody with access to sniff those connections or the ports will see all traffic on all VLANs that cross it. So just because, you know, a person may not have access to the network doesn't mean that they couldn't sniff all traffic. So, you know, using VLANs for security, while yes, if I plug a PC into a port that's set for only VLAN 10, he's not going to see traffic from VLAN 11. But if I connect it into a port that's 10, 11, 12, and 13, then he can absolutely see some of that traffic. So keep that in mind when you're using this for traffic separation. Now, VLANs use a standard format to what we call tag frames. So an Ethernet frame is tagged with a VLAN. It's an industry standard IEEE 802.1Q, and it's like a regular Ethernet frame, but with an extra 4-byte header designating which VLAN is in. You know, in this information, the header tells the network device which VLAN the frame belongs in. So really, going back to the security discussion, what's to stop me from hooking up a computer to a port and kind of, you know, forging my own frames? you know, creating fake frames with fake VLAN headers and sending things to a different VLAN. Well, it's very possible, and that's one reason we'll talk about later in best practices why you want to limit which VLANs can actually be sent and received on a switch port. If you limit, you know, where I can't, that port doesn't talk on VLAN 11, even if I try to forge a frame on VLAN 11, the switch isn't going to pass it. It's going to see, say it's invalid, and just drop the frame. But 
you know, it is part of a simple 4 byte header. Here's a quick diagram showing a VLAN frame and a little bit of kind of a, call it a logical or whatever diagram at the bottom. But we have a single, you know, physical network with multiple virtual networks running inside of it. This could denote a cable. It could denote a switch. It could, could, it could denote a fabric made up of 20 switches. It doesn't really matter. You know, we can have these virtual networks extend all the way across those fabrics. And, you know, vice versa, we can say only a couple of switches out of the 20 actually carry certain VLAN. So a VLAN doesn't, you know, necessarily travel across all switches. You know, you may have a server VLAN in the data center, and that VLAN does not exist out on the access switches where end user devices connect. But here shows the frame and the simple 4 byte header with some information. Just know it does take up a little bit of space in the frame. Some recommendations. So the number of VLANs you can use is often dictated by your networking equipment. First of all, there is a VLAN 0, you know, kind of a blank VLAN, and normally that's not even exposed, but you can't use it if it is. Almost everything, every switch that, you know, supports Layer 2 VLANs defaults to everything being on VLAN 1. Highly suggest you don't use VLAN 1. Reason being is that there's some special things that operate on VLAN 1. Uh, it's sometimes not beneficial to restrict access to VLAN 1. So my recommendation is always leave VLAN 1 there and enabled, but use other VLANs for everything else. It's really common that I'll walk into an environment and be asked to kind of do a review of the virtual environment and see VLAN 1 being used for servers or, you know, storage or something like that. And I always recommend that you don't use it. Most equipment can go over 4,000 VLANs. Cisco switches do that. Most switches do that. Though you're not often able to use them all at once. So some things like... Uh, the Nexus 1000V was limited to 512 active VLANs at one time. So if you wanted 2,000 active VLANs, some things couldn't support it. So just keep that in mind. Even though they may allow you to go up to 4,000, you can't always use all those, even though it's pretty rare to see anybody need that many. Other things, there are some reserved VLANs. Cisco switches, if you do a show VLAN command on most Cisco switches, even if you've never configured a VLAN, it'll say VLAN 1, which is the default. And then some other VLANs for legacy uses that really aren't used anymore, but they're still reserved. So make sure for whatever switch vendor you're using, you know what those reserved VLANs are. Usually they're really high up in number and not something you're just going to run into. Make sure you know which, if any, VLAN on a physical port is set for native VLAN. So simply put, native VLANs are untagged. So if I have a switch, and let's say he has VLANs 1 through 10 that are configured on that switch, and I go to one of the ports and I configure one of the ports, I'm going to say I'm going to let you trunk all 10 VLANs, 1 through 10, to the vSphere host that I'm going to plug into you. But VLAN 1 is native, and by default on most switches it, it is set to native. So VLAN 1 is native, 2 through 10 are not. What that means is, is any time that switch sends a frame out that port for VLANs 2 through 10, it's got that 4 byte header in it with a tag for a VLAN. When it sends out a frame, that goes out for VLAN 1, it doesn't have the header and it's not tagged. That's called a native VLAN. So you want to be careful because if I set my VMware host to expect a tagged VLAN 1 and he receives an untagged frame or vice versa, he sends out a tagged VLAN 1 frame and the switch gets it, they'll drop it. And this was a pretty common issue. I see this a lot in vSwitch configurations. It's one of these simple day one implementation things that people ask me about. My recommendation is that you change your net, your standard or default native VLAN on a switch to some obscure VLAN number you're not going to use. You know, set it for 3000 or 3500 or something odd that you'll know you'll never use in market. And then make sure every other VLAN is tagged as it comes in and out of the port connected to your vSphere host. That'll get rid of any weirdness, anything like that, that you forgot that VLAN 1 was native and it's not working right. And, etc. So I highly suggest you, you move that to an unused VLAN number. Uh, suggest to only trunk VLANs you actually need. So going back to our example, I have 10 VLANs. I'm plugging my vSphere host into it. If that NIC that I'm plugging into it is only going to be used for, say, iSCSI, and iSCSI is VLAN 7, why are you trunking 1 through 10? Well, it's, you know, a lot of times people get lazy, and I'm like the worst of this. I trunk all VLANs on all ports, that I connect to vSphere host, like in my lab and stuff like that. But really, you want to only trunk the things you need. Now, that adds a little bit of work. 
So if I want to add VLAN, you know, let's say I only did VLAN 7, but now I need to do 10. I have to add 10 to the vSphere side, which I'll do via port groups and stuff anyway. And then I'll need to add VLAN 10 to the switch side and add it to the port and all that and test it. So it does add more administration when you do want to add an additional VLAN, but it's much better security. If you ever go through an audit or, any, or you're under compliance, that's one thing they will pick apart is that you're allowing traffic across connections that shouldn't be there. So anytime anything sends a broadcast out on a different VLAN, it'll show up. Someone could plug a host into that switch and configure it to talk on a certain VLAN and have access to those devices, etc. So it's just best that you only pass the VLANs that you need. Another common question is who does the tagging of frames? Well, a minute ago, when an example, I said the switch does it or the vSphere host does it. So what's the issue? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, you can have other things tag frames. So it's who is responsible for inserting that little header and marking the proper VLAN. So your three options are the physical switch. This is what you do when you do not trunk VLANs to your vSphere host. And this will make more sense in a second. But if you've ever used a Cisco switch and you've put a port in access mode, you're letting the physical switch do the tagging. So what that means is that I take a, you know, my, my notebook, my MacBook Air, and I plug it into a switch port and I uh, have to use my little Ethernet dongle, but I plug it into a switch port. Now my MacBook Air doesn't tag frames. Uh, he can be configured to do that, but by default, most all desktops, notebooks, things like that, do not tag frames. They don't really deal in the concept of VLANs. They just send untagged frames. So you're telling that switch port, hey, when you get a frame in from your end device, your client out there, it's going to be on, say, VLAN 5. So I'm going to put this port in access mode on VLAN 5. When you get this untagged frame in, go ahead, when you receive it, slap a VLAN 5 tag on it, and then send it out through the rest of the switching fabric. When it gets a reply on VLAN 5 that needs to go to that end client, strip out that VLAN tag, and then send the frame out as untagged. So the switch does the work of tagging and untagging frames before your end device sees them. I don't recommend you do this for VMware hosts. I recommend you always tag frames going to and from a host, but again, I do see this in deployments. I see it less and less, but it does happen, uh, mainly on flat networks without much VLANs or anything like that. Even if you're going to do something like that, it's still best to tag it because it's going to make things easier later. If I want to do vMotion and move it over to another network, if I'm doing everything over the same untagged networks, it makes it much harder to kind of easily flip that to another NIC or something like that. The next option is the most common, which is the virtual switch tags of frames. So this is what you do when you set the physical switch to trunk VLANs down. Basically, when the physical switch sends out a frame, it's going to be tagged already. When your virtual switch, this can be a standard vSwitch, it can be a distributed vSwitch, but when it receives it, it expects to see a tagged frame. And when he turns around and sends a frame back out of the physical switch, he'll make sure it's tagged. So if a VM is plugged into a port group that is set for VLAN tagging VLAN 5, the guest OS and the VM doesn't tag the frames. He doesn't ever see tagged frames. He just sends something out his virtual NIC. When the vSwitch gets it, he goes, OK, that virtual NIC was connected to port group server, which is set for VLAN 5 tagging. So I'm going to tag that frame with VLAN 5 and ship it out my physical connection up to the switch, who in turn expects to see a tagged frame. When the physical switch wants to send something back, he tags it, sends it over, the vSwitch gets it, goes, oh, look, this is on VLAN 5. It's destined for that guest VM up there. So I'm going to remove the VLAN tag and pass it on up to the guest. So the vSwitch does all the work of tagging and untagging your frames. And again, this is the most common, and it's what I recommend that you use. And then you just set your port groups to tag it for the appropriate VLANs. The third option, the least common, is guest OS tagging. So what you can do is you can have the guest OS understand tagged frames. He will tag frames on the right VLAN before he hands them over to the vSwitch or sends them out as, you know, his virtual emulated NIC. And when they come back in, they'll still have the frames uh, with the tags intact. And you have to install an 802.1Q driver in the guest OS and configure it to operate on the correct VLAN. So let's see, when would this be common? I've seen this used on, like, virtual routers, virtual firewalls, things like that that operate on multiple VLANs but only use a single you know, physical connection. You can have them do things with 
VLAN connection. So it's not common, but it absolutely can be used. So here's a quick diagram to kind of hopefully simplify this. So this is physical switch tagging. This is where we set this switch port here to access mode. And I'm using Cisco terminology, but it's pretty common throughout the industry, meaning it's an access switch. Usually, again, this normally means that an end host device, a client device that's not intelligent about VLANing, is connected to the port. So tags are added and removed as frames enter and leave the port. Again, he's going to, this guy right here, the vSphere host is going to be set to untagged, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But he's going to send untagged frames across the network into here. The switch is then going to tag it and send it off where it needs to go. When a frame comes back, he's going to get the frame with a tag in it from another switch. He's going to remove it and then send it to the host. So across the wire are untagged frames. That means that only one VLAN can cross this cable. I can't have five VLANs cross a cable in an access mode port because you're not going to know which VLAN they're for. The tags are removed. They all look the same. So that's not an option. Next is virtual switch tagging. So we set the port over here on the physical switch to trunk mode. And then we say, well, you're going to trunk a bunch of VLANs. Here's the list of VLANs I'm going to allow you to trunk. And when you send a frame out, add a tag on it. And anything coming back should have a tag attached unless it's the native VLAN. And we talked about how you really want to, you know, kind of move that out and use all tagged frames. So we'll set this to trunk. The port group on your vSphere server will be set for tagging and you'll give it a VLAN ID. So all frames crossing this wire will have VLAN tags. And this way you can trunk multiple VLANs on the same piece of cable because inside this physical cable are going to be frames with different VLAN tags. So VLAN 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all traveling across that same piece of cable. And this is the most common and most recommended configuration. And then you have guest OS tagging. So, like before, the physical switch is set for trunk mode. He's going to send out a bunch of frames with VLAN tags for different VLANs. The frames crossing the wire are tagged. We set the port group to 4095 or a range, and we'll talk about how you configure vSphere in a second. But you put a driver in the guest to handle this. So as this tagged frame comes out of here, crosses the cable, it hits the NIC, hits the vSwitch, and the vSwitch hands it directly to the guest without removing that frame tag. So the guest gets it as is, and he is responsible for making sure it's the right VLAN, making sure the tags are right, and delivering it to the right up-level process. So again, very rare, but there are cases where you need to do this. So here's how you set up your vSwitches for your different tag options. It's just a quick table that I created. makes it very simple. So if you're going to let the physical switch do it, meaning we set the port in access mode, on a standard V switch, you say you put the VLAN number as zero or null blank, basically. If you are doing the DV switch, there is a setting and it's just none. The name is none, and we'll see that here in the lab in a second. If you're going to let the virtual switch, either the V switch or the distributed V switch, do the tagging, which again, the most common and highly recommended option. On the standard V switch, on your port group, you say, okay. I'm going to tag this VLAN 10. You just punch in 10 in the VLAN field and off you go. For the DV switch, you say VLAN and you'll see that it's an option of VLAN and it'll say, well, okay, give me a number and it'll be 1 through 4094, which is the most it supports. So you'll punch in, you know, 10 there and continue on. If you're going to let the guest OS do it, you first install that driver in the guest. And then on the standard V switch for your port group, you put 4095 in for the VLAN number, and that just means hand it up as is, don't mess with VLAN tags. For DV switch, the option is called VLAN trunking, so you say, okay, then we'll do VLAN trunking, and then you can give it the range of VLAN IDs, 1 through 10, 1 through 100, 1, 8, 14, whatever you want, just give it the range that it should expect to see. So a couple gotchas when using VLANs, nothing too major here. First of all, again, watch out for your native VLANs. That's the most common issue I see. Setting a port group to the same VLAN as native can cause communication issues. Again, it's expecting a tag frame. It gets an untagged frame, doesn't know what to do with it because, you know, he doesn't know what's native and what's not. It's, you know, even if you only have one VLAN and one port group in a vSwitch and only one NIC connected to it, he still doesn't know what to do with that untagged frame. So make sure that you aren't using native VLANs. 
Uh, if you tell vSphere to tag a frame from a port group, make sure the physical switch is set for trunking. So if you're going to send out tagged frames, that physical switch has to be expecting them. If he's in access mode for, say, VLAN 5, and he receives a tagged frame even for VLAN 5, normally he'll drop it. So again, you're going to have some issues. Trunk the VLANs you need, and only the ones you need. Again, good security and just good management. Recommend that you disable the spanning tree protocol on ports connected to vSphere hosts and enable the port fast functionality. We'll talk about this in depth in the physical connectivity lesson, but basically you don't want these ports connected to vSphere hosts participating in spanning tree. They, they really can't, but you need to tell those ports that you're not going to participate in spanning tree. You're not going to connect a physical switch to those ports. It's a vSphere host. The reason being is that when you plug a cable into a standard port, that does operate with spanning tree, it can take 50 seconds before that port actually goes online. It has to go through a whole discovery process, basically. By you know disabling that or setting the port fast option, you tell it that, hey, we're not going to connect another switch to this. Just go ahead and go ahead and let the, the switch function. vSphere does not support negotiation of trunk settings, so make sure and force trunking on. On your physical switch, you need to enable trunking you'll need to set it to own, no sort of negotiation, and just give it the VLANs. You know, sometimes we can do things where they negotiate available VLANs or what the options are. Doesn't support that with vSphere, so we just force it on and set the VLANs. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and jump to the lab. I'm just going to show you the configuration options for each of your VLAN tagging modes, and I'll show you uh, both on the standard vSwitch and on the vSphere distributed switch. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over to the lab. Okay, we are back over in my lab here in vCenter. So let's take a look at a few things. We'll just pick a server. Let's start with Megatron here. Go to networking. Let me move this over, get it out of our way, since I remembered that he had some NICs and a vSwitch as well. So let's look at the properties on a standard vSwitch. We'll look at the properties, and we'll look at, say, the VM network port group. If we edit that, by default, it is set as zero or none, which means untagged. To use this, you're going to need to put your physical switch in access mode. But normally, you want to go ahead and tag it with a VLAN. Say, for me, my VM network is 5, so VLAN 5. I say OK, and he is going to change that, and then he's going to tag anything going out with VLAN 5, and anything coming in, he's going to expect to see a VLAN 5 tag. If you wanted to do a guest OS trunking, you could do all, meaning VLAN 4095, say OK, and then any VM with a VNIC that I connect to the VM network port group here will need to have those that 8021Q driver installed. So some NICs have that, there are third party installations for that, but you'll need to install something there. So it's pretty simple. I mean, you do everything right here. I'm going to set this back to five. And you do everything right there, and that's the only setting. What you type in there denotes what happens. The DV switch has a little bit, I don't know, a little different configuration. I think it makes a bit more sense. So if we go to networking, I'm sorry, inventory networking. And I realize we haven't done our in-depth distributed switch chapter yet, but we'll, or lesson yet, but we'll get there. But these are all my port groups that I've created. Let's take a look at... VM network. Again, this is my internal kind of production network. We'll say manage this distributed port group. And we'll go here to VLAN. And we've got a few options. So none is simple. That again equates to zero or null on the standard vSwitch, meaning the physical switch should be in access mode. And anything coming or going or across the wire is going to be untagged. So you can't really do logical separation. Most of the time you're going to say VLAN and you're going to give it an ID like I have here, 5. And so anything that's connected to this port group, any frames sent will be tagged with 5, and any frames that come in tagged with 5 will be sent through this port group and up to the appropriate virtual machine. And finally, VLAN trunking. Again, if you want to let the guest OS handle the uh, VLAN tagging, you can do that here. You can do 1 through 5, comma 8, comma 10, comma 11 through 15. It's very flexible on how it lets you do these. Just make sure that this matches whatever the trunking configuration is on the physical switch. So remember, when you do guest OS, VLAN tagging, the switch is set for trunk mode, just like if we want to let the vSwitch tag. And any VLANs that you let come through, you'll need to mirror here. So let me just cancel out of this. 
And that's really it. Well, one thing, we'll get into this more in a minute, but you may have seen this a second ago. The other option is private VLAN, and we'll talk about that here in a second in the lesson. But that's really it. Just remember that VLAN tagging is a per port group configuration. Each port group will be different. Maybe. It is possible, and it's fairly common, to have two port groups with the same VLAN number. Why would I do that? Mm, just to make things easier to manage. So let's say that management and your servers were on the same IP range. You may have a management port group tagging VLAN 10 and a server port group VLAN 10. So really it works just fine when a frame comes in for the network for VLAN 10. The vSwitch looks at it looks at the destination MAC address and figures out which VM it goes to. So it's not an issue to have multiple port groups on the same VLAN. Uh, that way later if you decide, okay, we're going to move management to another VLAN, say VLAN 11, we can just go in there, change the port groups, change their tagging, and change it on the switch, but all anything that's connected to that, that port group, any VMs, we don't have to change those because we went ahead and did that up front. So it is common to see that and there's no problem doing it. So that's it for this quick little lab. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. Next, private VLANs. And this is really the more advanced functionality of VLANs. And it's something that I don't think is utilized enough. It, it's, it is a kind of a security feature for VLANs. And the idea is kind of confusing the first time you see it. But really, once you look at it, it starts to make a lot more sense. With private VLANs, you can provide segmentation within a VLAN or within the same broadcast domain. And normally we can do this by MAC filtering. So on a switch I can say this MAC address can talk to this MAC address but not these. So maybe I have an FTP server in my DMZ network that's exposed and I say okay FTP server your MAC address is allowed to talk to the firewall or router but not to the mail server that's also in the DMZ. So it is capable, you know, you can do this using MAC filters on switches, but that's extremely cumbersome. So another option is private VLANs, and you can kind of think of it like, a, like VLANs in a VLAN. And a common use case is DMZ, where we've got this exposed network, and we kind of want to put some limitations and controls, but really you can use this in a lot of other cases. Maybe in a DMZ, you've got, you know, you don't want certain servers to talk to each other. They're all in the same broadcast domain. They all are on the same IP network. You don't have firewalls between all your devices because that again gets complicated, but I want to restrict access. So maybe I don't want FTP talking to the web servers. Well, I can put a firewall between them, I can do MAC filter, or I can use private VLANs. And then you've got some devices that like everything needs to talk to. So while I don't want FTP server to talk to the web server, both of those guys need to talk to the firewall or the router. So we, you know, it can be a very complex situation. Private VLANs use a concept of primary VLAN and secondary VLANs. The primary VLAN is your main VLAN for the network segment. So it's the one that everything is on. So, you know, in a DMZ it may be VLAN 100. You know, that's the, the VLAN for that network. Secondary VLANs provide the segmentation inside the primary. And this will make more sense when you see actually how you configure it in the distributed virtual switch and that is a requirement to have the DVS or the 1KV to do private VLANs. You can't do this with the standard vSwitch. So there are three types of secondary VLANs. First is promiscuous. Devices on this VLAN can communicate with one of the isolated VLANs and multiple community VLANs. So usually the same as a primary VLAN. What I mean by this is when you see the configuration in the DV switch We'll say the primary VLAN is 100, and the promiscuous will also be 100. It's just the way it is. There are I've seen some switches where you can have different, but in the DV switch, they are the same. So you'll put your common devices in this VLAN. So VLAN 100 would have your firewall or your router, something like that. Things that need to communicate with everybody in the private VLAN need to go in the promiscuous VLAN. Next is the isolated secondary VLAN. So devices in the isolated VLAN can only communicate with those on the promiscuous VLAN, but not others in the isolated. So again, let's say I've got an FTP server and a web server, and neither of those guys need to talk to each other or any other server, but they need to talk to that firewall. So we'll put the firewall in the promiscuous VLAN. We'll put FTP and web in the isolated VLAN. And even though they're both in the same isolated VLAN, they can't talk to each other. It won't work. 
it gets filtered, but they can talk to the firewall. Conversely to that, we have the community VLAN. So the community VLAN can talk to anything on the promiscuous VLAN as well as anything else in the same community VLAN. So let's say you've got a web farm and they need to talk to each other to maintain status or something like that just to make sure that each of them are healthy. We would create a community VLAN and we can have more than one and we will take all those and put them in there. And then maybe we have three FTP servers that replicate data between each other for mirroring that need to talk to each other. We'll put those in a different community VLAN. And then the web servers can all talk amongst themselves, but they can't talk to the FTP servers. The FTP servers can all talk amongst themselves, but they can't talk to the web servers. And both of these can talk to the firewall. So with this kind of tiered strategy, you can have groups of servers that can talk to each other, isolated servers that can't talk to each other, and common devices that can talk to everybody. So here's a quick cheat sheet. The primary VLAN is your main VLAN for the segment. Secondary VLANs provide the segmentation. So promiscuous, he talks to one isolated VLAN. Why just one? Because if I put 100 devices in an isolated VLAN, they can't talk to each other, so there's no reason to have multiple isolated VLANs. So one isolated VLAN, multiple community VLANs, used for common devices such as firewalls. Isolated? He only talks to devices on the promiscuous VLAN, not to anybody else, not even to uh, his other buddies in the same isolated VLAN. So servers that only need to communicate to the common device, kind of single servers that don't talk to anybody else. And then community, devices on the promiscuous VLAN and devices in the same community. So again, if you have a farm or a cluster of systems that need to talk to each other, you'd put them in a community VLAN. And here's kind of a, you know, a, a numeric view of that. So we have the main primary VLAN of 100, promiscuous VLAN of 100, and then we could have isolated 101 and community 102. And this chart reiterates what each thing can talk to. And here's a quick DMZ network example. So we have firewalls here. And these are blue, so they're promiscuous. So these ports on these firewalls are promiscuous. Anything here can talk to these guys and vice versa. Then we've got orange. This is a community. We've got a cluster of DNS servers. They do zone transfers between each other. Therefore, they need to talk to each other, and they need to talk to the firewall, so we put them in a community. Yellow here is another community VLAN, but it's an application cluster. It's a different zone. So these guys can talk to each other and the firewalls, but they can't talk to anybody else. And then finally, isolated red. So we have a single email server and a single FTP server. They don't need to talk to each other on this segment. They only need to talk to the firewalls to get out to the internet or internal or whatever. So we put those in the single isolated. So it lets you see how we tier this. Configuring uh, private VLANs is pretty simple. Again, you have to have the vSphere distributed switch or the Nexus 1000V. We're not going to cover the 1KV configuration here, just the VDS. And it's a two-step process. So you do the association of primary and secondary VLANs in the main switch configuration. And then on each port group, you tell them which port or which VLAN to use. So you'll create them like we've done here. And we'll do this in the lab. So the primary is 10. And notice it grays them promiscuous. You can't change that. So he is also 10. And then I set 11 for an isolated. And what I would do to attach VMs to the isolated or the promiscuous is in each port group, when you set the VLAN, I would do the drop-down box to say private VLAN, and then say 10 or 11, or whatever I wanted it to be. And so it's a two-step process. So let's go see this live, and I'll show you how to do this, and hopefully it'll make even more sense, and you'll see how easy it is to configure. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over to the lab. Okay. Back again in the lab, take a look here. I have, I've renamed my XP machines here just to make a little bit more sense so we can kind of do something. So we'll simulate a router, which will be in the promiscuous VLAN, FTP, which will be in isolated, and two DNS servers that we will put in a community VLAN. So to do this, the first thing we need to do is go configure the distributed switch. So go to inventory and networking, which again, you can go inventory networking here. And so we'll click the main switch. Mine is called Nash Lab VDS. And we will manage this vSphere distributed switch. If we look up across the top is private VLAN. So click that. And then it's a little bit weird on this interface. It makes sense, but it's kind of odd. So there's no add or anything like that. If you want to enter a new primary, we'll do it here. 
and so we will do 100 as the primary and then you can have multiple primaries you just add another one here here and here and when you click on one you set up the sub VLANs or secondary VLANs on the right so again it's set 100 is promiscuous because it matches the primary and then we can do 101 for isolated and and it's weird because there's text here 102 for community and you can continue to add you know say 103 uh, it I was gonna say I was gonna see if it let me do multiple isolated so I've never actually I don't know if I've ever tried that I know it only works with one but I want to see if it let me as soon as I click off of it it says no but you can do multiple communities so that is acceptable but we'll pull this out for one so we've got 100 is promiscuous 101 is isolated 102 is community we'll say OK and that'll go through oh yep <laughs> I already have 100 that's my external network so let me do that again my mistake so we'll do 200 take that one. That's the only downside to being a fan of big round numbers. You always end up running into the same numbers and VLANs and all that good stuff. There. Ooh, ooh, community. And there. Ah, much better completed. So next, we need to create the port groups for these VLANs. So we'll create a new port group. We'll give it a name. We'll call this one Promiscuous because we're just doing this an example. On the VLAN type, you remember that earlier, showed you the different options. For this, we'll choose Private VLAN, and then it says which of the ones that you've already configured do you want. So you notice I'm not allowed to type things in here. It pulls it from the already configured list. Promiscuous, isolated, or community, it shows the primary VLAN and then the secondary. So 200, 200, 200, 201, 200, 202. For this, we'll do 200, 200. That looks good to me. And we'll do the next two. Also, while I'm doing this, if you're going to do this across a network, you're going to want to configure your physical switches the same way. So you'll need to go ahead and do that. I'm going to let you in on a secret. My lab switch, none of my lab switches, if you remember lesson one, I have an SG300 Cisco small business switch. I have an HP 1810, kind of their small business. And I have some of the nice Cisco 2960S switches. None of those support private VLANs. Uh, much to my chagrin when I was going to test this out a while back. So the way I'm going to demo this for you and the way you can do it, if you're in the same situation, what you can do is what I'm doing here to demo it, which is if all your VMs are on the same host, the traffic never leaves the distributed switch. Therefore, the physical switch config doesn't matter. So I'll show you that in a second. Private and community. So excuse my misdirection there for a second. I've created three new port groups and matched them up to the correct VLAN numbers. So we'll go back to my host and if we look let's look at summary tab he is on well, bumblebee right there bumblebee 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 so there we go if they're on the same none of the other stuff matters so then let's go ahead and change the configurations here so the router is going to be on the promiscuous vlan so we'll do network adapter change it and promiscuous say OK FTP is going to be on isolated so edit network adapter isolated and I suggest you name these something that means something else to you maybe FTP maybe you know whatever community DMZ but again demonstration community especially if you have multiple community VLANs you don't want them you know the name community doesn't really mean much. I see people that do VLAN, or I'm sorry, port group names that are like I do a lot of times. If it's a port group connected to VLAN 10, they call it VLAN 10. Or I'll do servers space VLAN 10. I like to show the VLAN number in the port group name. I just think that makes things easier when you're picking one. But completely up to you. So at this point, everything is good to go. So let's start with FTP. Bring the console up for him. A very boring XP desktop. 500 pop-ups for Windows. 
So by default, he should be able to ping the router, which is dot one seventy two. There we go. One ninety two, one six eight, two hundred one seventy two. I built this guy last. The other ones I've had, and I use them for all sorts of things. This one I built last. Stop telling me things. And uh, I didn't turn his firewall off. So that should be good to go. Let's go back to FTP. Stop telling me things. There we go. Doesn't that make a lot more sense? So he can ping the router. He should not be able to ping either of the DNS servers. So he should not be able to ping 155 or... 189. 155 does not work. 189 does not work. But if I jump over here to 189, which is one of my pretend DNS servers, so DNS, DNS2, stop telling me things, now works. So again, just to give a quick review since we had a couple of issues there. The router is in the promiscuous mode. He can ping everybody. So 192, 168, 200, 155. That works. 189. That works. And FTP, whose IP I can't then look up, is 131. that works. Now, the FTP server here can only ping the router. He cannot ping DNS number one. Oop. 189 or DNS number two. So even though they're on the same IP network, even though I don't have any firewalls between them, I don't have vShield running, I don't have the Windows firewall, I don't have any other firewall, they cannot communicate. But the two DNS servers can. So this is DNS1.155, ping 192.168.200.189, which is your buddy, and he can. He, however, cannot talk to FTP, who is 131, So therefore, what we're getting is basically layer 2 security by using private VLANs. So this is how you can set up private VLANs to support, say, a DMZ network without having to carve it up and do subnetting of the IP addresses and firewalls between hosts or layer 2 MAC filtering on a switch or anything like that. You can do it all within the switch. And you can do this on physical switches as well. Uh, physical, most good physical switches, unlike the ones in my lab, support this. Uh, you can also do it on the Nexus 1000V, and uh, it's something that I think is very underutilized. I see people do very convoluted things to get this sort of security mechanism because they just don't really ever look at private VLANs, or it looks more complicated than it is. Hopefully this lab has shown you, even without the little issues, that it's very simple. You set up the primary VLAN, which in turn is the promiscuous, that's what you put your common devices in. Then you put devices you don't want to talk to anybody but those common in an isolated VLAN. And then if you have little server farms that need to communicate with each other, you can put each one in its own community VLAN. And so it's very simple and very easy. So that's it for this demo. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. And finally, I just want to have a quick word on vSwitch security configurations. These haven't changed. If you've gone through a standard VMware course, you probably touched on these and they're really the same in both the vSwitch and the distributed virtual switch. The 1000V from Cisco has much deeper security configuration controls. Uh, that's one of the nice value adds that it gives you, but for the standard vSwitch you have your three options here. Your promiscuous mode, whether you basically you allow a VM to be able to sniff packets and scan packets on the vSwitch, really any packets going across it, even if it's not, doesn't have access or it's the wrong MAC address. Promiscuous mode lets the, the guest OS enable that promiscuous mode on the NIC and kind of sniff traffic. 
So this is an option that's currently used a lot with things like clustering or load balancers when they need to monitor traffic that may not belong to them if they have a shared MAC address or something like that. The other ones are MAC address changes, which allows a guest OS to change its MAC address from the one that VMware assigned. And forge transmits, where a guest OS can send out a frame with a source MAC address that is different from what it has been assigned. And again, check with your different use cases. Normally, the defaults of reject for promiscuous and accept and accept work for about everything. I usually recommend, VMware recommends, most auditors are going to recommend you set all these to reject on a across the board. And then if you do have something that needs them enabled, again, like a load balancer or some like Microsoft clustering, that you create a port group just with this enabled and attach just the VMs that need it to that port group don't make it a system-wide or an, you know, an environment-wide setting. They are useful for stopping impersonation attacks, things like that, to try to get around security controls. So again, normally I recommend you set these all to reject unless you absolutely need them. And real quick, just something that comes up from time to time is where do VM MAC addresses come from? It's real simple. Uh, every virtual machine has its own MAC address. Really, every NIC in a VM has its own MAC address. So if you have one VM with 10 NICs, it's going to have at least 10 MAC addresses. They are stored in the VM's VMX file. So if you've ever pulled up that text file, which is basically the config, you'll see it. Uh, there's an example, Ethernet, Ethernet generated address equals, and that's the MAC address. And it's generated when the VM is powered on. And it's kind of broken out. So the first three bytes are VMware's what we call OUI, or Organizationally Unique Identifier. So if a VM is started from the vSphere host, it uses vSphere's OUI of 00C029. If I created this VM and started it up from vCenter, then it uses vCenter's, which is 005056. So it's most common to see 005056. Those OUIs are assigned to VMware as a unique identifier. So, you know, Broadcom has their own three-digit identifier. Cisco has their own three-digit identifier. Everybody gets their own, and then VMware is responsible for trying to make sure the rest, the rest of the address, those last three byte fields, are unique when it hands them out. So when, say, Broadcom makes a bunch of NICs, and it has its th first three fields that are it, the last three, it makes sure that, you know, Broadcom makes sure that it doesn't create or make two NICs with the same numbers. VMware is a little different. He's not pressing NICs. I don't know what your VMware environment looks like. I don't know what MAC addresses are used in yours. You don't know what's used in mine. So we have to kind of do some math. And so the last three bytes are based on a couple of things. First is the SMBIOS, Universally Unique Identifier for the Physical Host. And really this is what comes up basically out of the system BIOS on the physical host. So it uses a unique identifier from there. And it also uses a hash based on the name of the virtual machine. So it combines those and gets what we'd consider to be a pretty unique identifier. That uh, is within the realm of possibility that you could have two VMs with the same MAC address. I've never seen that happen. But I guess it is in the realm of possibility. So key thing is first three fields are assigned to VMware. And there's two options depending on who starts the VM. If it's from the host itself or if it's from vCenter, it'll be one of the two OUIs. And then the last three fields are based on a hash of the VM name and a unique identifier from the physical host. So real quick, jump back to the lab and show you the security settings, and that should do it. So let's go ahead and jump on over to the lab. Back once again, and this is pretty simple. So first I'll start on Megatron standard vSwitch properties and if we look let's edit the vSwitch security and here's your options I mean these are the default settings one thing to keep in mind is that I can go to a port group security and I can override these so like I said my suggestion is to go into the vSwitch set them all to reject and then if you have specific use case make a port group for that use case connect only the VMs to it that need it, and then override the vSwitch setting. If we go look at the DV switch, networking, we can look at the distributed switch itself, and there's really nothing in here 
Just wanted to show you that you don't set any of this, so there's not like a policy-wide kind of setting for this. But what you can do is go to, say, my external VLAN, external port group, manage that guy, security, and you get the same options. And then you can just set all those to reject or accept on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, there's nothing complicated here. One thing I do want to point out is there's really no more security settings on the distributed switch than there are in the standard V switch. So you get what you get, and really that's what you get. That's one nice value add of the Nexus switch from Cisco is you do get some more security options. So that's it for this quick little walkthrough. Let's jump back to the slide deck. So that's it for the lesson. It was, a, I thought, you know, a good lesson walkthrough on VLANs, primarily on private VLANs. So we started off with what exactly are VLANs. Talked about how you can take a physical network, slice and dice and carve it up into a bunch of virtual networks. Allows you to, you know, logically separate traffic for better management, better control, better broadcast control. Gave you some recommendations on VLANs. Don't use VLAN 1. Pay attention to what are reserved VLANs. You know, let the trunk connections over to the vSphere switch, thing, things like that. Be careful on who's handling the VLAN tagging. Highly suggested you let the vSwitch handle the tagging. Set your physical switch for trunking. Let the vSwitch do the tagging unless you have a specific use case for something like guest OS tagging. But if you're doing access port mode right now where you don't tag, I really suggest you convert over. It's not hard to convert from access to VLAN thanks to things like you know uh, vMotion, I've done it, again, in a production environment with zero downtime. Just do one host at a time, make the change on the vSphere host, then make the change on the physical switch, and you'll see connectivity come back up, and everything's good. Gotchas when using VLANs, you know, don't use native VLANs. Check your trunking. Only trunk the VLANs that you need. Things like that. Pretty much common sense. Then private VLANs. So private VLANs let you sub-segment a larger VLAN. Again, a common use case is a DMZ network where we may want to have we may have servers that we want to talk to the firewall or router but not talk to each other. And normally we do this with firewalls or MAC address security, things like that. Private VLANs allow us to set one kind of you know primary VLAN and then three secondary VLANs inside of it. A promiscuous VLAN for your common devices, isolated VLAN for devices you don't want to be able to talk to anything but the common devices. And then community VLANs, which you can have multiple community VLANs for things like server farms that need to talk to each other, as well as the common devices. And finally, your good old security settings on the vSwitch. There's nothing new here on the distributed switch. It's the same as what we've had on the standard vSwitch for a while. If you need to go above and beyond, that's a good use case for the Cisco switch. So that's it for the VLAN lesson. Uh, hopefully it was good. Hopefully you got a lot out of the private VLAN lab. And with that, uh, say thank you, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next lesson.